We ask, Lord Jesus, for your anointing upon our time together in your word. We believe, Lord, that you are a God who is not silent, but you speak to your people. And so we ask now, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, by the power and the presence of your spirit. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we come this morning to John chapter uh, 6, starting at verse 47, we come right in the middle of a sermon or a discourse that Jesus is giving in a synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum is that city on the north part of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus made his adopted home. You know, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, but the Gospel of Matthew tells us that when he began his ministry, he began and made Capernaum his own adopted home. This is where Jesus lived during the days of his ministry. And there in Capernaum, we're going to find this out in verse 59 of our text today, Jesus spoke these words in the synagogue, almost certainly during a synagogue service. So there he is speaking to a crowd of people. Imagine yourself being part of that synagogue crowd. There you are, you're listening to Jesus, and he's saying things that are frankly mind-blowing to you. We'll get right into it right here in verse 47. Take a look. This is the middle of a message preached in a synagogue in Capernaum. Verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This, the bread, this is the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Friends, there's a few things that are just absolutely staggering in just these few verses that John records in his gospel. The first thing I want you to notice is in verse 47 where he says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Friends, that's a staggering statement. First of all, understand what Jesus means by believe. Sometimes I think that there's no more necessary thing in our day and age than for us to carefully define what believe means. When we say believe in our modern age, most people think it just means to intellectually assent. I believe that Jesus existed, therefore I believe in Jesus. No. The New Testament concept and word essentially has this idea, to trust in Jesus, to rely on Jesus, to cling to Jesus, to have a trusting love in him. So when I ask a person, do you believe in Jesus? I'm not interested so much if they believe he existed. I want to know, do they trust in him? Do they rely on him? Do they cling to him? Do they have this trusting love? Now, if you do, Jesus says, look at it right there in verse 47, he who believes in me has everlasting life. What an audacious thing for a man to say. A man with hair on his head, fingers, toes, just like any of us. And more than any of the prophets, friends, Isaiah would never have said such a thing. King David would have never said such a thing. John the Baptist, this greatest of prophets among men, he would have never said, believe in me and have everlasting life. But Jesus is so bold, so audacious. He says, I am different than them all. I am not only the son of God, I am God the son. I'm different from every prophet, every messenger, every king that Israel has ever produced. I am the son of God. Believe in me and find everlasting life. Now, based on that same concept, he sort of explains it in a different terminology. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. This isn't the first time he's mentioned it in this little discourse. Jesus is being repetitive with his audience. You know what they say is the first rule of teaching? Repetition. You know what they say is the second rule of teaching? Repetition. The third rule of teaching? Repetition. And all throughout this discourse, Jesus sort of hammers on the idea, I am the bread of life. His repeated and continued use of this metaphor just to communicate something very basic to us. Just as bread is necessary for physical life, so Jesus is necessary for spiritual and eternal life. Now, you know, we talk about bread in this sense because in that culture, bread was the staple of the diet. That's what everybody ate. That was the basic food of everybody, everybody ate. Listen, if Jesus was speaking to an Asian culture, he might have said, I am the rice of life. Seriously. He might have said, I am the pasta of life to a different culture. 
He, he might have said to a Swedish culture, I am the hard bread of life. You know, different cultures just have these staple foods. It's just what you eat. That's what Jesus is saying. Somebody suggested to me between services that to a modern age, Jesus might have said, I am the smartphone of life. (laughs) Now listen, yes and no. Because I know that for many of you, your smartphone is more precious to you than food itself. (laughs) You cannot eat it. You could, I know the thought terrifies you, you could live without your smartphone. But you can't live without food. You must have it. If you don't have it, you will die. You need it not only for survival, but you need it for strength and nourishment. And Jesus is saying, I am like that in the spiritual realm. You must have me, not just for survival, but if you feed upon me, I am the bread of life. If you do that, you will be strong and healthy in your spiritual life. And so he just continues this idea. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. I'm a different kind of bread. I have come down from heaven. I have come to satisfy what this world longs for just as much as a hungry man longs for food. Friends, I just want you to think, but you get the metaphor. This isn't complicated, is it? But here's what I want you to understand. Using this metaphor, we can grab hold of the idea. Everybody feeds on something. Something nourishes and sustains your life. For for some people, it's a drive to succeed. For other people, it's a drive for education. For other people, it's it's, uh, uh, how many likes I get on social media. Something drives you. Something sustains you. Something satisfies you. Jesus says, I must be that satisfaction for your life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven because every other kind of bread, so to speak, using this metaphor, is not going to make you healthy, is not going to make you strong, and is not going to have you survive. We get this, right? We get this metaphor with food. There's good, healthy food you can eat, and then there's what you and I eat week to week. (laughs) Now, you can eat that bad stuff. You can, and, and we do. You know, you can go to the market and you can get those little hostess donut gems, chocolate covered and powdered sugar covered. You can tell I know too much about these things. And if you wanted to, you can make that your diet all day long. You could do that and you would live for a while, but eventually you'd become sick. You'd probably eventually succumb to some kind of illness and maybe even die if this was your diet. Jesus says, that's not enough. You've got to eat not just what's being dished out by the world around you, not just what comes forth. You need bread from heaven and I am that bread from heaven. And I am perfectly healthy. You feed upon me and you'll be strong. You feed upon me and it'll be just like, you know, just like that stuff that you should eat, that you like to buy. All that gluten-free, whole grain, double organic, whatever it is. Man, that's it. Jesus is that perfect food for you and I. And that's why he says, now, all that metaphor in yourself right there. Now, if you understand that, when he extends the metaphor in verse 51, you're not going to be surprised. He says this, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, friends, Jesus plainly explained what he meant by bread in this context. The bread was his flesh, his body, which was given for the life of the world. When did Jesus lay down his body for the life of the world? When he hung on the cross. And Jesus is narrowing the focus even more. He says this, if you will feed on me the bread of heaven, the core of that food, it's not found in my moral example. It's not found in the ethical things that I give. It's not found in the healings that I did, as spectacular as they were. If you want to find the core of what it means that I am the bread of life, it is the body that I laid down for the world on the cross. You know, the Apostle Paul later would preach very much along these lines when he would say things like this, that the emphasis of his ministry was Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is it. My flesh laid down for the world. So again, Jesus explains, receiving him as bread, it's not the same as receiving him as a great moral teacher, an example, or a prophet. It's not even receiving him as a good or a great man or a noble martyr. It's receiving him in light of what he did on the cross. The ultimate act of love for lost and perishing humanity. He lays it all out there. Now friends, you've understand the metaphors that he's used up to this point. 
Now, you understanding them, put yourself in the audience when somebody shouts this out to Jesus in the middle of his discourse in that synagogue at Capernaum. Verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Friends, that was a dishonest question. Does anybody think that Jesus meant, take a bite out of my arm and you'll have eternal life? The metaphors he's using are not difficult. They're not strange in rabbinic or Old Testament thinking. These are very natural metaphors that he's speaking in. And somebody did the disgrace of willfully misunderstanding Jesus. Have you ever suffered that? Where somebody purposefully takes your words and twists them. You said it, and you said it as clear as you could. I mean, if there was a more clear way you could say it, then you would have been delighted to do it. But as clear as you could say it, you said it. And that person, knowing what you said and knowing what you meant, they took it and they twisted it to say something otherwise. Friends, that's something a little painful to live with, isn't it? And kind of one makes you backtrack on what you said. Jesus didn't backtrack one bit. And friends, this is the part where Jesus gets into the message where I open my eyes as a preacher. I go, Jesus, you preach like nobody else ever preached. Because another person in this situation would say, oh, no, 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 let me explain to you what I mean. I didn't mean take a bite out of my arm. I mean, that's... No, what Jesus did was he amped it up. He got in their face even more. What, look, let's just see what he means. Verse 54, 53. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now he introduces the picture, not only of eating the flesh, but drinking the blood. Friends, this was revolting to the Jewish mind of that day. Because according to the kosher preparation of meat, you drain it of blood completely. But friends, what does flesh and blood speak of to somebody in the first century in this Jewish context? Very plain, sacrifice. That's what's poured out at sacrifice. At sacrifice at the altar, blood is shed. At sacrifice at the altar, the flesh is offered or shared by the person bringing the sacrifice. Jesus is narrowing the focus, just as he said back in verse 51, which I shall give for the life of the world. That implies a sacrifice. He doubles down on that and he says, my flesh and my blood, it is my sacrifice that you must consume, that you must have a focus upon. Friends, this is a very, very strong statement of Jesus. And I love this whole idea that he didn't back off. He doubled down on what he was going to say to that particular audience. And then continuing on, verse 54, he, he deepens it even more. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Friends, you see what Jesus said? Look at verse 55. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. The sacrificed life of Jesus is food and drink for the hungry and thirsty soul. Is anyone hungry? Is anyone thirsty? I'm not talking about the lunch that you're thinking about, you know, in, in, in a little while that you're going to partake of. I'm talking about hungry in your soul. I'm talking about thirsty in your soul. You try to satisfy it with, so to speak, we'll use the metaphor, a lot of junk food, a lot of bad things, maybe even a little bit of poison, and you're dying from it. You, you have no satisfaction in those things. You are on the road to death from what you've been consuming spiritually. Jesus says, come, eat my flesh, drink my blood, pointing it all back to sacrifice. Him with his life poured out at Calvary. That's what he's pointing it back to again and again. Now, these kind of radical statements offend many people. And I tell you, I think Jesus deliberately, deliberately, wanted to bring this offense to his listeners. You see, 
He made the metaphors stronger in the face of those who twisted his words, not weaker. And he refused to back down from the truth. I am the bread of life. And the substance of that bread is his sacrifice on the cross, the giving of his flesh and blood. And what he gave at the cross, we must receive. Now, food is such a perfect picture of that, isn't it? Because first of all, everybody must eat for themselves. The last time somebody ate for you was when you nursed at your mother's breast. That's the last time somebody ate for you. Other than that, you got to eat food yourself. So nobody can eat for you, and you must do your business with Jesus individually yourself. Secondly, you must appropriate it into yourself. Your trust in Jesus can't be an external thing just on the outside of you, keeping it at a safe distance. No, you have to internalize it. It has to come within you. And then, just like the food you eat assimilates into your body, so Jesus must assimilate into your entire life. You know that saying, you are what you eat. It's even more true spiritually than it is physically. And Jesus says, come, follow me. Look to me and what I did for you on the cross. Look at my broken flesh upon the cross. Look at my poured out blood. Make that your focus. Make that your food and drink. And there will be satisfaction to your soul. Look at what he says in verse 57. He who feeds on me will live because of me. Those who do come to Jesus and believe upon him, feed upon him, they will find life. They will live. But but, but not because they've found or earned the answer, but because Jesus has freely given. And that's the other great thing about it. You know, if you think about it in this sense, and if we want to draw the metaphor of a meal, many of you, you are happy to satisfy with Jesus, so to speak, if you can prepare the meal. If somehow your works can be involved with it, Jesus says, no, this is food that I give to you. It's just my gift. What's your job? Taking and eating it. Well, that doesn't seem very complicated, does it? You just take and eat it, but you have to do it. He's not, and I apologize for extending this metaphor, but he's not going to shove it down your throat. He says, you take and eat. Here it is. But you got to eat what I bring to you. It's all pointed back to my sacrifice on the cross. And the great message of verse 58 He who eats this bread will live forever. Friends, he offers you heavenly bread for eternal life. But again, you must eat it. Think of a loaf of bread on a table. You you don't satisfy your hunger by looking at the loaf of bread. You you don't satisfy your hunger by, by knowing the ingredients in the bread or taking pictures of the bread or telling other people about the bread or selling the bread or, or, or playing with the bread. What do you have to do? You have to take it and as an individual act of faith. And have you ever thought about that? Every mouthful you put in is an act of faith. You put it in your mouth, you eat it, you assimilate it. into. Jesus says in a spiritual sense, do that with me and you will live forever. Friends, I don't know about you, but to me, that's a beautiful invitation, isn't it? It's a remarkable one. Is anyone hungry? Is anyone thirsty? Here is the satisfaction for your soul. It's a beautiful um, invitation. But the way Jesus presented it offended many people. Look at it right here in verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, now please, look at that in verse 60, many of his disciples. John here is using disciples in the broad sense. There were thousands who were fed by Jesus by the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Many of them followed him to Capernaum. Were they disciples? Well, they followed Jesus. They were listening to the sermon, but he's not using disciples in the specific sense. This is not the 12. We're going to get to the 12 in a little bit. No, this is a broad sense of disciples. Start again at verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Friends, I'm not an expert in the ancient Greek language, but but I know how to read the guys who are. And and, and in reading the guys who are experts in the ancient Greek language, they point something out in verse uh, 60, which really, in my New King James Version, is a relatively poor translation. 
In my translation, it says, who can understand it? That's not a good translation. Because the issue here with the original Greek phrasing and wording is not understand, it's to accept. It's not that what Jesus said was incomprehensible to them. They understood what he was saying. He was saying, I am the only way to find soul satisfaction and nothing else will satisfy. I am the bread come from heaven. That's it. They understood it. What they couldn't do was accept it. It's kind of funny as a, as a preacher, I feel my first responsibility is to help you understand it. And then plead with you to accept it. I can't make you accept it. At the end of the day, that's between you and God. But, but I feel some duty, some responsibility to do two things. First of all, present the message of Jesus as clearly as possible so that you can understand it. And it's not a complicated message to understand, is it? But to present it as clearly and then to plead with you to accept it. But you and I and we all know at the end of the day, it's up to you. And these, sadly, chose differently. They said, it's a hard saying. Who can understand it? Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Then I take back everything that I said. No, he didn't say that at all. Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. When I talk about food and flesh and blood, this offends you. What are you going to do when one day I ascend to the right hand of my Father on high and one day you have to answer before me in the day of judgment? What about then? Friends, let me tell you, it is far, far better to be offended now by Jesus and to get over it than to be offended by him on that day. Far better to get over it. Now, I know that sometimes what Jesus does and how he moves in our life offends us at different points. There are people who would say, you know what, Jesus, it really offended me because I thought you were going to work this, this, and this in my life, and it hasn't happened yet, and that really offends me. And Jesus, there was another time when I prayed, and I prayed sincerely, and I called upon you to do something, and it didn't happen. And this or that or the other thing. And and somehow, in some way, what Jesus does seems to offend us. You know what? Bring your offense to Jesus. Why don't you just tell him right now, Jesus, what you did offended me. Why don't you clear that up with him now? Because it's better to be offended by Jesus now and get over it. Rather than to be offended by him on that particular day. So he says, almost in a summation of everything he said before, verse 63... It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Nothing. I'm trying to draw your attention away from material bread and earthly kingdoms. That's what you're obsessed with. And Jesus says, no, I'm trying to lift up your hearts and minds to a realm of the spirit. Verse 65. And he said, therefore I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. First of all, notice two things. When people, excuse me, when Jesus could see that the hearts of people were turning away from him, his essential response was to see, I know that you can't come to me unless the Father draws you, which is something exactly that he said just a few verses prior. Friends, as we said last week, I'll say it again, the Bible teaches us that there is something so wrong in the human heart that we can't come to God unless he first acts upon us. And as these people begin to reject Jesus in their hearts, Jesus is saying, you you can't come to me unless the Father works upon you. But then notice it in the second part of it. This is in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Look, if I'm making a movie about the life of Jesus and we're dealing with this passage, I know how I'd film it. I don't know if this is how it happened, but I know how I would film it. 
Jesus is speaking to the synagogue, and there's some arguing back and forth. You know, you see, just like we read in this chapter, it's just exactly laid out. This isn't difficult to conceive of. But then when Jesus says those final things, a few prominent people in the synagogue stand up, and they walk out in a huff. We won't listen to such things. Who does he think he is? And when those few prominent people leave, you know how it works. Other people leave with them. Until pretty soon, it's only the 12 disciples left sitting in the synagogue. And Jesus stands there, watches them all leave. How do you think Jesus felt when he watched them all leave? Friends, don't you think that in some sense, this was a victory, or at least it seemed to be so, for the enemies of Jesus? The, the, those religious leaders who came up from Jerusalem, and Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 tells us that there were religious leaders from Jerusalem there at the synagogue, stirring up the crowd, causing the trouble. They, they, they were so skilled at twisting his words and creating controversy and putting the seeds of doubt that people just got up and they said, no, we're not going to have any more. And I bet in one sense Jesus was sad. Jesus was sad because he said, even if these people were not quite committed to me, at least they were hearing my word. And who knows what God can do in their life if they will hear my word. I think it saddened Jesus that they left. But on the other hand, he looked at the 12 that remained and he said, I can do something with these men. I don't need the great big multitude. Through these 12, God can do something amazing. But friends, don't miss it in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And even though when the synagogue emptied out, it looked like the enemies of Jesus had won, they had not. Because Jesus was playing for the long game. He wasn't playing the game of how big of a crowd can I immediately draw. That wasn't his heart at all. His was how can I make an impact on the world. And you know what? I'm staring out at a room full of people who are the legacy of the 12 he left behind. Isn't that exciting? You know, more than a billion believers gather all over the earth today, a legacy of the 12 he left behind. I'm sure it didn't make Jesus happy that the crowd walked away, but he said, I can do something with this 12. But first, first he had to speak to them. Look at this, verse 67. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Wow. Now, again, the experts in the ancient Greek language, this is what they'll say about this sentence. That Jesus asked the question in the form that implied a no answer. In other words, the way Jesus asked the question was something like this. You, you're not going to go away also, are you? He, he assumed a no answer because he had confidence in these men. You, you're not going to go away also, are you? But I'm going to give the opportunity. If you want to go, go. But I'm assuming you're going to stay. Look at what they said. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I imagine that when everybody walked out of the synagogue, it was deflating for the disciples as well. Man, I thought we were getting some momentum. We had a packed synagogue. Everybody was excited. And Jesus, he busted out that old flesh and blood thing, and now everybody's gone. <laughs> Maybe some of the disciples sighed heavily, but Peter spoke for them all and simply said this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus, first of all, your Lord. Means you get to set the rules. You're my master. If you do things I don't understand, well, I may not like it, but you're my master. Secondly, where else am I going to go? Jesus, following you isn't easy, but it's better than all the alternatives. I haven't found anything better. Friends, isn't that just how it is in the Christian life? Somebody said, I think Winston Churchill or somebody like that, said this about democracy. He said, democracy is the worst form of government ever devised, except for all the others. Sometimes the Christian life feels like that principle extended to the Christian life. The Christian life is the worst way to live, except for all the others. 
Because when you compare it, compare it to the life that others live both in time and eternity, you see, Lord, where else would I go? I know there's difficulties. I know there's pains. I know there's trials that I face for being a follower of Jesus. But what I gain in Jesus is so much greater. Where else would I go? And then they said, you have the words of eternal life. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And we feel some confidence in what God's going to do there with that group of the 12. All right, last two verses. Verse 70. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you the 12 and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the 12. Everybody leaves except for the 12. And the 12 say, we're all in, we're all committed. And they were, except for one who would go off the rails. I don't mean to get into a whole big discussion of Judas. Let me just say this. Judas's falling away does not make following Jesus invalid. And every once in a while, I'll talk with a person. I'll see something on social media or the internet. It kind of leads a person to say, well, this person turned their back on Jesus Christ. What about you? As if I should say, oh my, they fell away from the faith. I guess I should too. No, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Their crisis of faith is not my crisis of faith. Their doubts and rejection and, 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 and disgracing of Jesus. Listen, that, that's not my life. I don't have to disbelieve just because somebody else does. I'd rather number myself among the 11 than go off with the one, Judas. Friends, there will be people that fall away. There will. There was a Judas among the disciples. But you do not have to be that one. You, you can feed upon the bread of life. You can feed upon the bread from heaven. You can feed upon Jesus in his poured out blood and his given flesh for sacrifice at the cross. You can and find peace for your soul both for now and eternity in light of what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross. You can't bake that bread for yourself, but you can receive the bread of life that he comes to give to you. Here's the thing. It's like regular bread. You got to partake of it regularly. Here's the question. When did Judas stop eating that bread? Maybe somebody would say he never did. I don't know. But nobody who sustains that reception of the bread of life will ever, ever turn their back on Jesus. Father, this is my prayer. I pray first of all, Lord, for anybody here who hasn't come to the feast, that you would draw them just as you promised to do. But Lord, I pray for us um, that we would eat, that we would consume, that again and again we would find the satisfaction of our soul in Jesus Christ and especially in the work that he completed for us on the cross. Lord, we don't find life feeding on anything else. Where else would we go you have the words of eternal life. Seal this to our heart, Lord God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.